Today's Bible reading will be coming from John 15, 1 to 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Hey church, my name is Nathaniel and I'm part of the team here at BPCC working with our young people leading the youth ministry. And I have the privilege of unpacking God's word with us today. You know, it's a classic plot device which has been overused in many of the books and movies which I'm familiar with and which I'm sure you are as well. We have the protagonist, the hero of the story, and he's up against some sort of unbeatably difficult situation, impossible odds, an impossibly powerful enemy perhaps. And there's a moment where all seems lost, but then generally a wise mentor or someone tells them to search within themselves to find the power that they need to overcome this challenge. And they do that, cure dramatic montage, they unlock the power within themselves, they defeat the enemy, they win the situation, uh, and it all turns out good. In Kung Fu Panda, this happens when Po finally reads the legendary dragon scroll, which is said to contain the secret to limitless power. He opens it up and it's a mirror reflecting his own face back at him. And he realizes that the power he needs lies within himself, he just has to believe in himself. So with this newfound realization, Poe sets out and he defeats the terrible tiger, Tai Lung. And I'm sure that you can think of similar examples from stories that you're familiar with. This seems like a great motivational moral at first, a good one for us to, to learn from and apply to ourselves. When we come up against a difficult situation, the power that we need is to be found within ourselves. I've even heard it said that this is what the Bible teaches, but in reality, this is a crushing burden. Because when I look into myself, I don't find the power I need. I don't find the strength to, to do great things. I want to help people. I want to do good. I want to serve God well. But when I try to do that off my own bat, with my own strength and my own skill and initiative, I make mistakes. I mess it up. I get it wrong. And I just end up wearing myself out. But fortunately, this is not the message of the Bible. The Bible says that within us, we have no true power and that we can only do anything of worth through the strength that Jesus provides. That Jesus is like a vine and we are like branches coming off that vine. Now, this might seem like a negative message at first, but it is actually incredibly good news because it lifts the burden off our shoulders. We don't have to strive to do everything we possibly can because Jesus has already done it for us. And this is the message which Jesus gives us in today's passage. Now these verses come in the middle of a conversation between Jesus and his disciples, which is recorded in John chapters 14 to 16. We're looking at these chapters in our series, Untroubled Hearts at the moment. This is the final conversation which Jesus had before he gave his life on the cross. So we've been watching on as Jesus prepares his closest followers for what would happen and what would come after that. He told them that he was leaving them to prepare a place for them, and that he would return. And then just last week, we heard about Jesus' promise that he was leaving another helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with them always. And so, having promised that he will remain with us by the Holy Spirit, he now encourages us to remain with him. So the question is, what does this mean? What does it look like? 
and why must we do it? And these are the questions we're going to be looking at today. We'll be thinking about the meaning of abiding, the purpose of abiding, and the joy of abiding. Now, throughout this passage, Jesus repeatedly uses this image of him as the vine and us as the branches. It's yet another unflattering analogy that Jesus uses to describe us. We've, we've been described as sheep, as branches, as seeds, as coins. These aren't normally words we would use to describe ourselves, but each of them help us to see ourselves truly, and they help us to see and trust in the love and the glory of Jesus. Jesus uses the image of vine and branches this week to repeat the instruction that we are to remain in him. And that word remain is repeated quite a few times, nine times in our passage. And remain is a bit tricky to translate. If you're reading a Bible translation other than the NIV, uh, you might find that it says abide, which is probably a more helpful word for understanding uh, the original meaning here. To abide is to stand fast, to persist, to continue in something, as opposed to flitting around here and there. Abiding is a settled commitment. And this abiding is a two-way street, because first, when we place our faith in Jesus, He abides in us through the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus spoke about in the passage immediately before. Last week, uh, we heard as Adam unpacked Jesus' teaching about the Holy Spirit, the helper who is with us always. If you missed it, head along to our website and, and catch up on that. In short, Jesus remains in us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is, he is God himself as truly as Jesus is. And as we heard, Jesus says that it is better for us to have the Holy Spirit in us than to have Jesus physically with us. Because the Holy Spirit brings to us the presence, the truth, and the peace of God. And this promise which Jesus made to send the Holy Spirit has been kept. In fact, today is Pentecost Sunday, which marks the day exactly seven weeks after Jesus rose from the dead when the Holy Spirit was sent to his disciples, when it was poured out on them. And that same Spirit is alive in us today. Through the Spirit, God strengthens us, He supports us, and He abides in us. So abiding in Jesus flows out of us abiding, uh, flows out of Him abiding in us. It's not the other way around. He doesn't just wait for us to get our act together. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in us if we are to remain in Jesus. If we are like a fridge, he is like the electricity. So we've thought about how Jesus is with us. He is the vine. Let's think about ourselves, the branches. Because when we place our faith in Jesus, we are closely tied to him. We are, we are grafted in like a branch onto a vine. Branches get their water, their sustenance, their nutrients, their life through the vine. We can bear good fruit, but only through him. If we become separated from the vine, we will wither. And when he calls himself the true vine, Jesus is saying that when we seek our strength elsewhere, no matter how hard we work, we cannot produce true fruit. Useful fruit will only come from the branches which are tied to him. So we're not spiritually battery-powered. Now by that, I mean that we're not meant to just recharge on Jesus every now and again, go out and use up all our energy before coming back to Him to charge up again. No, we are branches, and we constantly abide in Him. In all we do, we are to do it in and for Him. Imagine how absurd it would be for a branch just to jump off and try to go make some fruit, leaving the plant behind. It doesn't work like that. And yet I know that I'm tempted to do that exact thing, to focus on Jesus when we're together and yet to go into my life and try to do things, to try to work for Jesus off my own back with my own strength. Is that something which you experience as well? The temptation to treat Jesus a bit like a petrol station, stopping in to fill up and then forgetting about him until the fuel light comes on. This is not about just being near to Jesus He's not saying to hang around with him occasionally and come to church on Sunday. Branches are to be connected to the vine 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, 366 if it's a leap year. 
So what does it look like to abide in Jesus? This looks like drawing all of our strength and motivation from him every day. And like he says in verse 7, having his words abide in us. This isn't about a specific action, but about an attitude, an approach to life. An approach which seeks to spend time with our God when and where we can. An approach which sees the Bible as God's word, as essential spiritual food. An approach which sees others as children of God who also desperately need Him. An approach which sees our work, our studies, our hobbies, everything in our life as ways that we can live for Jesus. Author and pastor Ray Ortland says on this, Do not content yourself with having a brush with Jesus now and then. You are always in His presence. Draw upon Him as your constant resource. He is willing to be to you all that you need. This world will disappoint you. The devil will corrupt you. Your own heart will betray you. Do not face all of that on your own. You can not only avoid sinking down into that misery, but you can also enter into life. Jesus has never failed any who put themselves in his care, and he will not fail you. He will live in and through you, and your life will matter forever. So, to abide in Jesus means to remain in Him, to rely on His strength in all that we do. And we can abide in Jesus because Jesus has first abided in us. But why does Jesus call us to abide? What's the purpose of our abiding? Well, unless we abide in Jesus, the true vine, we cannot bear true fruit. You might be wondering what exactly this fruit is. Is it like bringing more people to Jesus? Is it doing plenty of good things? Is it reading our Bible twice a day? Now, the fruit might lead to these things, and they're good things, but the fruit is something much better. The fruit is, essentially, becoming more like Jesus. It is His message, His character, His wisdom, and His love being expressed in us. And when Jesus abides in us through the Spirit, and we abide in Him, we begin to show the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this might be a familiar term because we discussed the fruit of the Spirit in a sermon series earlier on this year. This fruit of the Spirit is listed in Galatians 5, and we thought about it under the title of A Beautiful Life, which is an accurate title because that's exactly what a life featuring the fruit is. And we thought about the different fruit of the Spirit in great detail. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. These are great things, and in essence, this fruit is the result of becoming more like Jesus. And if we want to bear true fruit, we must abide in the true vine. But what if I don't feel like I'm seeing this in my life? I know that I often don't. I often look at my life and go, man, these fruit, they're pretty sparse. What does that mean for me? Why am I not bearing good enough fruit? And what happens? Because there is more to this vine imagery than that Jesus uses, right? He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it would be even more fruitful. Now, honestly, that's a scary metaphor. The idea of being pruned sounds painful, but if you're a gardener, then you know that pruning is a good thing for plants. It helps them to remain healthy, to grow well, to be more fruitful. And the same is true for the way that God prunes us. As we grow in Jesus, God does and will prune us. He removes anything that's not fruitful, the the stems and leaves which are maybe diseased, so that we may bear even more fruit without that dead weight. But God pruning us is an uncomfortable process, as things in our lives which we may like but which don't bear good fruit are removed. I'm sure that I've got a lot more pruning to go in my life, uh, but I can think of plenty of examples where God has led me through a difficult time or used a hard situation to remove something in me which, which needed to go or to grow something in me which, which needed to be made stronger. 
one example that comes to mind is patience. Now, I've definitely got a, a long way to go with patience, but I'm definitely a far more patient person than I used to be. And that is because God has put me through situations where I've had to wait. I've had to, to learn patience. And I didn't appreciate any of them at the time, but I'm glad that he's brought me through those because he has grown me using those situations. And I'm sure that you can think of plenty of examples in your own life as well. This doesn't mean that every painful thing in our life is, is God pruning us, because our world is a broken place, and the sin in the world around and the sin in our own hearts causes hurt and causes damage. But God does use everything that we go through for good, but there is even more to this imagery than just pruning. In verses 2 and 6, Jesus also talks about branches being removed. And it's not a gentle process. Uh, verse 6 says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burnt. Now that is a confronting picture. It's abrupt, it's fearsome it might make you feel a little bit scared. Would God just throw away people who aren't performing? Would he do that? Well, first, we need to ask the question, can a true believer in Jesus lose their salvation? And the answer to that is a resounding no. That's not what this passage is saying. And in fact, all throughout the Bible, it is very clear that those who are truly saved cannot be separated from the love of Jesus. For example, in John chapter 8, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So rather, this is talking about those who seem to be following Jesus, but whose faith is isn't really in Him. Because coming to church doesn't automatically make you a follower of Jesus. Now this shouldn't make you worried about whether you are saved as long as you answer yes to a simple question. Is your faith in Jesus? That is, do you know that He died to make a way for you to be right with God? Have you placed your life in His hands? Are you abiding in Him? Are you depending on the vine? This isn't about getting it right all the time. We're not expected to be perfect and none of us are perfect. But abiding in Jesus is not just an extra option for Christian overachievers. It's what we do as Christians. Abiding in Jesus is ordinary, everyday faith. So are you abiding in Jesus? It's not about getting it perfect. This is responding to God's love. God isn't just waiting to cast you away whenever you mess it up or get something wrong. He's ready to catch you when you slip. And he has got the pruning shears in hand. But if you're seeking to follow Jesus, they're not there to cut you off. No matter how much you mess up, he will prune us. And sometimes that will hurt. But the pruning is always for our good. Now let's be honest. This doesn't sound all too enjoyable. To become like Jesus, to be pruned by God, it sounds like a lot of pressure and it sounds like a lot of pain. Doesn't this just leave us with a burden to abide properly? To make sure that we're bearing fruit so that God won't cut us off? Have we just replaced the pressure of finding answers in ourselves with a pressure to be good enough at relying on God? No, the point of this is the opposite. We are not meant to read this passage and be weighed down by a need to perform. How can I be so certain of this? Because Jesus says so. That brings us to our third and final point, the joy of abiding. Now, in verse 10, we see that we will abide in Jesus if we keep his commands. And it's easy to misinterpret the phrasing here as meaning that we have to obey Jesus in order to keep on abiding in him. But throughout the Bible, it is clear that obedience is not a way to abide in Jesus' love, but it is a sign that we are. Just like fresh leaves and fruit are a sign that a branch is finding its strength in the vine, following Jesus' commands is not how we abide, it is a sign that we are abiding. 
And so what is it that Jesus commands? Well, Adam is going to unpack this for us more next week because this is what Jesus goes on to talk about next. However, in essence, Jesus' command is to love. To love in response to God's love to us. In the Gospel of John, which we're in at the moment, we see a focus on Jesus' teaching about love. We've repeatedly seen how God's love in Jesus motivates us to show love to others. We do what is right, not because we have to, not because we need to get up a certain number of Christian points to stay in God's good favour. No, but because we are responding to a God who we know loves and cares for us. God's love for us is the root and our obedience is the fruit. So rather than being a burden, Jesus' words here give us joy. He says in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Abiding in Jesus is the way to full and complete joy. Because when we abide in Him, it's not about us having to be enough, but knowing that He is already enough. It's going to Him for strength, not trying to find it inside ourselves. And this leads us to a joy that we can't get anywhere else. A joy which will last longer than anything else. We can easily find brief happiness in plenty of different things, but they're all going to let us down eventually. Whether it's people or possessions or achievements or status, they'll break or they'll let us down or they'll lose their appeal. They won't give us lasting joy. But in Jesus, we have a joy which lasts forever. A joy which will never perish, spoil or fade. Now that doesn't mean that we always feel happy. Rather, this is a deep-seated joy. An understanding that no matter what, Jesus is in control and he's not demanding anything from us. He's not expecting us to perform really well, otherwise he'll be angry. No, we have this joy which he has given to us and which we receive by abiding in him. I see this expressed in the testimony we heard just earlier from Cheryl. She said, He offers us peace that surpasses all understanding and guards our hearts and minds if we only come to him. When we are in Jesus, there is nothing that can take him away from us and nothing that can take us away from him. Because, again, as Cheryl said, when human understanding fails us, God is infinite. He is eternal. He is all-powerful. And he is all-knowing. And it is in him that we discover true joy. How about you? If you're already a Christian, can you imagine what life would be like without Jesus? Without the love and the hope and the joy that he gives you? Where else would you rather be? Where else could you possibly find what he freely gives to us? Continue to abide in him. Lean into him. Find your strength in him. And he will bear true fruit, true fruit within you. And if you're not a Christian, that joy, that peace, that strength, that is found freely in Jesus. He doesn't ask a price. You don't have to do a certain number of good things. He only asks for you. You don't earn your place on the vine. You are grafted on by the gardener, by grace and through faith. So what is your response today? When you encounter a challenge or struggle in life, will you be trying to beat it with your own strength? Will you be trying to find the solution within yourself? Or will you be abiding in Jesus so that when those challenges and struggles come up, you're trusting in Him for the answers, the direction, the strength and the ability which you need? Let's be fruitful branches. Let's rely in, on Him. Let's abide in Him. Let's respond to the love that He has shown us by showing love for God and others so that His joy may be complete within us. As we do that, we will bear true fruit, fruit which only Jesus can grow. Let me end by sharing an old song which really captures this theme for me really well. It's called Abide With Me. Now, we've heard before about the inspiring background of several hymns, like It Is Well, written by a man who had just lost his whole family to a tragic shipwreck. This one is different. Abide With Me was written by an Anglican priest who didn't do or experience anything momentous. 
he had a lifelong struggle with sickness. He was always unwell, and he wrote this song while wrestling against tuberculosis at the end of his life. It's not a dramatic story. It's the story of a normal human being who struggled as normal humans do. But a normal human being who is abiding in Jesus, relying on Him for their strength. And that's like many of our stories as well. So let's wrap up with the first and the last verses of that song. I won't sing it, don't worry. Abide with me, fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, O oh, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift that you have given us in Jesus. We thank you that you have provided us with the true vine, Lord. We thank you that you have grafted us in as branches, that we do not need to try and find strength within ourselves, that we don't need to overcome difficulties, Lord, that we don't even have to uh, do particularly well or have merit of our own in order to come to you, Lord, but that you welcome us freely and you give us strength which you provide. Father, I pray that as we go into our days and weeks, we will go remembering this. We will go intentionally abiding in you, waiting on you, relying on you. And Father, as we encounter difficulties and challenges and struggles in our, in our weeks ahead, we pray that you will guide us through those, that you will provide us with the answers and the ability and the strength that we need. Please continue to be with us, Lord, as we uh, overcome the, the virus situation and we spend time uh, with each other more and more. We pray this in your name. Amen.